In Empire at War, effectiveness is rarely described as annoyance, but in Star Wars, certain weapons and ships were developed with the purpose of annoying and deliberating the enemy. You're probably familiar with the Iron Cannon from the Battle of Hoth and how it was able to disable a Star Destroyer temporarily every time it fired. Darth Vader was, well, significantly annoyed by this and as a result, the Rebels successfully escaped. But in this Empire at War video, we'll highlight the unorthodox weapons that routinely catch players and admirals off guard. So without further ado, let's dive into it. First on our list, we mentioned the devastating potential of a planetary-based iron cannon. Well, what about a downscaled version? And what if you were able to install such guns on a highly durable New Republic capital ship? The New Republic Star Destroyer is somewhat small for a Star Destroyer, but can disable almost any adversary it can hit. While it does not carry a massive armament of turbo lasers, the stun ions specialize in crippling the power generators on board enemy vessels. This reduces shield recharge, speed, and fire rate, giving your fleet increased survivability. In addition to being an effective counter to overwhelming firepower, heavy stun irons have the added ability to shut down the hyperdrives of any class of ship provided the shields have been pierced. The usefulness of these weapons increase if you deploy them in a skirmish battle. These guns have long range and can affect a large portion of the battle space without necessitating speed. Thus, stunning your enemies will severely reduce their ability to react to your maneuvers. If you're trying to break past the enemy front line, you can advance hard to one side and stun any vessel pursuing your blockade runner. Even a dreadnought cruiser can outrun an ISD under these conditions. If you push past their main formation, their forces will scatter in an attempt to engage. By this time, the enemy is now scattered, stunned, and outmaneuvered. Whether you choose to close the snare and eliminate the enemy vessels, or go for the space station, you're in a pretty strong position to do so. While the new Republic Star Destroyer is not geared towards 1v1 combat, it provides massive benefits and flexibility to any fleet it supports. Coming in next, we have the Imperial Broadside Cruiser as we swap from stunning weapons to explosives. The Broadside Cruiser is the accumulation of decades of investment in long-range rocket technology. For the Broadside, the Victory One Cruiser was brought into service at the end of the Clone Wars. It proved extremely effective, but was eventually phased out after years of advancement in weapons technology. The Gladiator was an attempt to improve the missile carrier design, but in the end it failed to impress the Empire with its comparatively tepid firepower. Following the lackluster reception of the Gladiator Cruiser, the Broadside Cruiser began development as a highly accurate anti-capital missile artillery piece. This new missile artillery would use rare Diamond Boron missiles to pinpoint targets on the capital ship's hull, whilst also creating a blast capable of incapacitating starfighters within a 50 meter radius. Due to its nature as a backline artillery piece, it's quite slow and unmaneuverable. Coupled with its high cost of production, losing broadside cruisers is just as annoying as facing them. Thankfully, because of the abundance of firepower each Diamond Boron missile has, one full volley from the cruiser can potentially wipe out a hardpoint on a heavy armoured capital ship. For this reason, you would be wise to only keep a limited number of broadsides on the field at a single time. That way, you avoid firing multiple volleys at one hardpoint that would have been destroyed with only one volley. And as we've mentioned before in our videos, overkill is wasteful in this game. Remember, the ability to hold the line without crumbling is just as important as inflicting damage. Some broadsides can be equipped with mag pulse missiles, which can temporarily cripple enemies. But before I explain mag pulse missiles to you, let's explore another cruiser who specializes in disabling. Because up next as one of the most annoying ships in Empire at War is the MC-40. The MC-40 is a destroyer with the emphasis placed on disabling enemies. It is equipped with a good amount of turbo lasers to fit its role as a destroyer. In addition to its turbo lasers, it carries a hangar with a room for bomber craft. To fulfill its desired function as a disabler, one Magpulse missile launcher is strapped to the port and starboard of each MC-40. Magpulse missiles are similar to stun ions, but do not have the same functions. Stun ions can shut down the power supply of ships, giving it all sorts of debuffs. Magpulse missiles, on the other hand, have more limited scope. 
Whilst this ionized ordnance does pierce and strip shields, it does negligible damage and only debuffs the enemy's fire rate. The MC-40 is a capable fire support vessel, meant to engage at close to medium range. Like the broadside cruiser, having more than two MC-40s on the battlefield would be redundant. And whilst it is more sturdier than the broadside, it will likely lose most 1v1 fights against a larger vessel. So, to navigate in space, one must be aware of nearby gravity signatures in order to stay on one's desired course. Next up on our list is the Hapen's Battle Dragon. One of the most annoying things in Empire War is none other than the gravity well generators. These in-game prevent you or the enemy from escaping the skirmish. Thus, if you bring a fleet to the battlefield that you cannot afford to lose and the enemy has gravity well generators, then that is a dire situation to be in. And the Empire did exactly that as they employed gravity well generators on board interdiction cruisers to prevent adversaries from leaving the battlefield. But the Hanks Consortium did something similar with the development of pulse mass mines, which they would equip to none other than their Hapes Battle Dragon. Battle Dragons had minimal anti-fighter defenses, so in order to increase the effectiveness of Hapen fighters, they would deploy their pulse mass mines. In the Awakening of the Rebellion mod, these served to severely reduce enemy mobility and strip shields from fighters and cruisers alike. The pulse mass generators are positioned 360 degrees around the ship, making it especially dangerous to attack a swarm of fighters. The range of this weapon is limited, so if you intend to strip the shields of anything larger than the Starfighter, you'll need to be close in combat. In conclusion, don't get too close to Hape and Battle Dragons. Next up is a ship that is as fun as it is annoying to deal with, which is none other than the Malevolence. Switching from Awaken the Rebellion to Fall of the Republic, the Malevolence has the same weaponry from the Clone Wars TV show. Apart from its incredible array of guns at the front of the ship, this massive provenance looking vessel wields two mega iron cannons, one for each broadside. The size and effect of these guns are absolutely titanic, and in order to draw enough power to fire these weapons, the ship itself must also be titanic. Five times bigger than the Venator Star Destroyer, the Malevolence can engage an entire fleet if it were required to. Of course, sending the ship alone is never advisable, but it can hold its own against uneven odds. The Mega Iron Cannons do crippling amount of damage to any shields it hits, and while the cannons are recharging, the Malevolence can unleash a deadly barrage of turbo laser fire from the bow of the ship. Theoretically, the Mega Iron Cannons also disable Starfighters, but good luck catching any of those little slippery pilots in the path of such a slow-moving and obvious threat. That being said, this ship was designed to clear a path past the clones' lines in order to attack weak points in the Republic Navy. Weak points like space stations, supply hubs, or scatter reinforcements. In all of these cases, the Malevolence was meant to neutralize large targets with exceeding efficiency, carrying fighters mostly for defense. Next on our list, we return to the Galactic Civil War, as our next ship is a pseudo super weapon dubbed the Arc Hammer. The reason this ship deserves super weapon like status is because it provides a function that significantly impacts any sector it is currently in. The Arc Hammer has no super laser, iron beam, or remarkable firepower to speak of. Instead, it fulfills its design as a support vessel with dizzying effect. In Star Wars lore, the Ark Hammer was a factory ship meant to supplement ground forces and boarding parties with hyper-elite Dark Troopers. The Dark Trooper project was greenlit as it promised excellent soldiers for a fraction of the time and cost of a shock trooper. To achieve this, the soldier must be entirely robotic, hence requiring a factory. To keep the project secret, the factory would need to be mobile and be able to quickly deploy and receive Dark Troopers for missions across the galaxy. However, in the Awakening the Rebellion mod, apart from the Dark Trooper production, the Arc Hammer assembles and launches hundreds of TIE experimental fighters, also completely droid piloted. Fighting the Arc Hammer is like attacking a beehive. It seemingly has endless reserve of fighters being fired out of a dozen different hangars. No matter how you elect to engage the Arc Hammer, it likely won't be an easy objective. Whilst the TIE experimental fighters are not exceptional starships, there are an exceptional number of them, and even to destroy the hangars of an Arc Hammer is a difficult task, as they are numerous. If you see an Arc Hammer, hope it's on your side. 
So next up, do you know what a space sniper looks like? Well, I can show you what it feels like. The Vengeance Frigate has two rotating mass drivers that can penetrate shields with impressive accuracy. As the Empire, Vengeance Frigates will target your shield's hardpoints, disabling them. Since the Rebellion's navy is heavily Mon Cal based, disabling shields is usually not an option. So the Vengeance Frigate turns the Rebellion's greatest asset into a weakness. Rebel capital ships are normally equipped with the best shield technology in the galaxy. However, the strength of the frigate's mass drivers is that it completely ignores shielding. Unfortunately, only two mass drivers and its relatively fragile hull do not allow this ship to deal a killing blow often. Instead, the Vengeance frigate specializes in sniping hardpoints. The mass drivers work to lower the enemy's damage potential while the fight is still early. That's not the extent of the effectiveness of the mass drivers though, as they can be upgraded to fire carbonite projectiles via the black market. This upgraded ammunition deals damage to shields instead of hull, and it also serves to decrease fire rate and mobility. Don't worry about having to pick between one ammunition and the other, as you can switch ammo at any time during the battle in-game. Before returning to the armament of the Rebellion, there is one more pirate-affiliated vessel that causes significant irritation on the battlefield. The small, fast, accurate and sticky Etty Cruiser. As a ship used by the pirates, it had to be fast and maneuverable, and because pirates like big guns, it's equipped with heavy weapons for its size. Slightly larger than a CR-90, the Etty Cruiser has four heavy laser cannons and two long-range turbo lasers. Because of its size and cost, you can afford to bring a dozen of these ships on engagements. Its speed and firepower aren't what causes headaches for your enemy though. Every Etty Cruiser is outfitted with a tractor beam, and due to the availability of these vessels, you can lock down corvettes and frigates without even having to maintain fire. These are perfect for finishing off vessels who rotate out of front lines. Its good range and ability to slow enemies has been the demise of many arcs and cruisers. In the events that you've pushed your cruisers out of position, they can boost power to engines and regroup with the main battle line. With Etty cruisers bringing utility and fire support, it's nice to use and infuriating to fight. And finally, arguably the most head-splitting, irritating vessel to come up against is none other than the MC-30 torpedo boat. The MC-30 is the smallest unit in the video besides the Etty cruiser. Its purpose is to engage capital ships as a destroyer, capable of dealing significant damage even if the enemy has shields up. What makes the MC-30 so unpleasant to fight is that it's small enough to evade heavy turbo lasers whilst powerful enough to disable a Star Destroyer. In almost any 1v1 fight, the MC-30 would be at a disadvantage. However, it's tiny enough to fire from the front lines without drawing significant attention to itself. Even if enemies focus their fire on the frigate, it has the ability to overload its shields so that it may reposition away from any danger. In numbers, MC-30s are a serious threat and if ignored, could cost you your most well-armoured ships. To reiterate, the MC-30 is made to attack heavy armoured targets who lack weapons small enough to accurately return fire. Thanks to the frigate's armament of torpedoes and turbo lasers, it will reliably do damage to any large target it can reach. It is the perfect counter to oversized guns of the Empire and it will break your heart to see one of your Dreadnought class ships be eaten away by the Rebellion's torpedoes. And that is the end of our list. Did you get any ideas for new strategies for your next campaign? If not, don't worry. Highlighting these particular weapons and ships will surely contribute to your battlefield success. And also, did we miss any other annoying or uncommon weapons that we would otherwise should have mentioned? If you do know of any weapons we can include for part 2 on this list, leave them in the comments down below, as I do my best to read them all. But besides that guys, I have been Charlie, you've been watching X2, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care guys. Thanks.